Hello and welcome to the special on the print. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is currently on a very key visit to the US. While of course he has visited US in the past, uh, this is his first state visit. Yes, there is a difference between his earlier visits and the visits now. A uh, lot of important uh, things are up for discussion, not just on the strategic front, not just on the economic front, but also on other key issues. And uh, many of these strategic and key issues include defense. Uh, there are talks of a mega deal that is likely to be signed between uh, the American firm G and the HAL over the uh, GF414 engines that will power India's future fighter aircraft program. You also have, of course, a, a deal which is in the making as far as uh, the drones, that is the hail, that is the high altitude, long endurance drones are concerned. This is a tri-service contract that will be signed. Besides that, there are a number of other deals which are in the working. There is also a semiconductor uh, uh, business proposal which is coming up in Gujarat. That is, again, a key project. So, you know, I have with me a very special person and a very uh, learned, knowledgeable person to walk us through about the significance of this visit, what we can expect from this visit, and how is it different from the earlier visits. Well, I have with me uh, Syed Agruddin, the former uh, diplomat. He retired uh, a few years back. He was also India's uh, permanent representative to the United Nations. And he's someone who's closely uh, followed the entire diplomacy around the government. So welcome to the print, sir. Thank you very much, Nehesh. It's a pleasure to engage with you. Thank you, sir. So my first question uh, to you is, explain to me and the viewers, how is this trip different from his earlier trips in terms of state visit? Why were his earlier trips not state visit and why is this now state visit? Um, first of all, um, let me uh, try and distance myself and see this uh, from an ordinary person's perspective. Um, most of the visits uh, that were done previously and which I was following was as a diplomat. Uh, so from my perspective, um, it seems to have generated an extraordinary level of interest both in India and in the U.S. I haven't seen this sort of an interest, especially among uh, U.S. Uh, intelligentsia, uh, decision makers, Congress persons, businessmen, etc. Um, in the past. So this seems to be a different level of excitement about it. That's number one. But a state visit. A state visit is perhaps the most important uh, visit in the pantheon of protocol of diplomacy. Uh, by that, I mean we generally have uh, working visits, official visits, and then the state visit is the highest in terms of what a state can extend to another state's uh, leader. Uh, in India, we've only had, I think, since independence, three state visits. The first was in 1963 when President Radhakrishnan, uh, the scholar uh, statesman, was invited by President uh, Kennedy. The second was um, uh, by when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, visited in 2009. And now it's the third one. So you can see that in 75 years, there are only three state visits. And you can see why it's given an importance. Finally, uh, um, even every president is very choosy about who he calls for uh, state visits. Uh, president Biden, this is only his third hosting of a state visit. He had the President Macron of France. We had the, earlier this year the South Korean president and now Prime Minister Modi. So these are rare events. These have special significance, both in terms of protocol in pageantry and in substance too. Um, so it's a different level uh, of excitement, a different level of interest, and this is the highest that a, a pre U.S. president can offer to um, exemplify the uh, degree of engagement with the country or with the personality also. So you mentioned that uh, you know this visit, there's a lot of excitement around this visit, and a lot of excitement primarily relates to some key. Uh, packs that are going to 
to be signed, especially in the defense uh, sector. So one of us is the jet engine technology. Now, this has been India's long dream. It was a project started in the 80s to have indigenous jet engine never fructified. Uh, is this Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, Manmohan Singh movement in the sense that when Manmohan Singh's nuclear deal, you know, that was a very significant, which marked a clear shift in Indo-US ties. Would this particular jet engine technology deal, would it be yet another similar to what the nuclear deal was for the both countries? Um, so it's uh, not fair to make comparisons um, uh, uh, between different eras, but certainly um, defense is a force multiplier, not only in terms of um, uh, equipment, but in terms of the um, uh, follow on effect it has on the economy. Um, any defense deal uh, uh, brings in technology, which is um, required, brings in skills. Uh, which are necessary, and then they have a whole ancillary units which spring up to support those deals. So, uh, given that our needs for technology are growing, given that our skills need to be uh, enhanced, uh, given that our defense uh, 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 equipment needs to be updated, for all these reasons, uh, defense has a special salience. And I agree that it's a consolidation over what uh, India and the US have been engaged with in several years. As you said, there have been many frameworks uh, in many uh, uh, eras of the past. Uh, many of them didn't work, but this seems to be a greater willingness now to find a framework that will enable India to pursue its strategic autonomy and uh, allow the US to work with a partner who is not necessary an ally in the military sense. And that's the bigger uh, picture of finding via media and pathways uh, in, a, uh, in both bureaucracies where for long engagement has been stalled because we couldn't find correct pathways. So interesting that there are two key words that you used. One was strategic autonomy, you know, uh, and uh, the other one was that, you know, the U.S. might not be in a military alliance with, but is still giving the technology. Now, when you look at the larger Indo-U.S. relationship and moving forward, we are now part of multiple groupings. Uh, uh, the Quad is there. Of course, Quad is said to be a non-military alliance, uh, but how do you, where do you see this relationship really going forward? Remember that there is a Russia angle to it, and there is, of course, the China angle to it. So, yes, um, let me put it um, in another way. Um, the broader landscape is dominated by geopolitics. Uh, and actually, um, we are in a world where terminologies such as chip choke, friend shoring have gained currency. So you can see that geopolitics is key in any engagement. Now, uh, in such a uh, landscape, if the US and India are to overcome uh, what were institutional uh, difficulties and engage with uh, each other in some of the key technologies where uh, sharing is a very difficult um, uh, uh, process. Uh, it clearly means that we have moved to a new era. Uh, that era is as yet, I would say, undefined uh, because uh, we are used to either being partners, junior partners, senior partner, alliance partner. That's what we are used to. We are not used to a 24, 25 trillion dollar economy engaging with a 3.75 uh, dollar, uh, uh, trillion dollar economy uh, as partners. Because you would think that, oh, this is a one-sided partnership. But obviously, both sides think that it's an investment in future. Uh, because the trajectory of our ties has been such that they have been growing across in a bipartisan manner. One president comes and goes, another prime minister comes and goes, and they have been growing 
um, and the uh, trajectory is just on the upward swing. So if I were to see how this is going to change, if technology is key to the future, uh, this is an opening. Um, you know, uh, some time ago, uh, there was talk that um, uh, the U.S. is going to build, uh, is going to have a small yard with high fences. Uh, this is an entry of India into the small yard. Uh, otherwise, you would have been beyond the high fence. Uh, it basically uh, acknowledges that there is a relationship which goes beyond minor transaction. It's clearly, you may call it a strategic relationship. You may call it a long-term relationship. You may call it by different names. But what it basically says is that there are convergence of interests uh, which make this um, a unique moment in our bilateral ties. You know, you mentioned about the fact that there's convergence of interest. Uh, besides the economic factor, besides Russia, one really common issue that really faces both the countries, US and India, is China. You know, uh, let's face it, China is the big elephant in the room and one can't ignore it. Is it is it so that a relationship is purely based or is driven by the China factor, sir? So you're right um, that geopolitical uh, the geopolitical landscape cannot be ignored. China is a challenge to the U.S. and China is a challenge to India, uh, and we are both trying to address it in different ways. But I wouldn't put it that it's central to our ties. And let me um, try and explain. Look at what our needs are, China agnostic needs. China agnostic needs for India's development are technology, investment, skills. These are all required for our economic development. And if foreign policy and uh, ties beyond boundaries are to address these needs, whether there is China, whether there are challenges from China or not, we will need these. And there are very few spaces in the world open to us because given that we have a China challenge, we can't go to them for these needs. So we have to look at the West. That's number one. Number two is you have forgotten the diaspora. The diaspora between India and the US is a bridge, uh, which is again, China agnostic. The educational links between our students and their universities, uh, the CEOs of so many um, American companies who have Indian heritage, all these have brought the US and India together. Yes, uh, China may have uh, expedited that in a certain time frame and that we shouldn't ignore, uh, but we shouldn't also make that the centerpiece of our ties because if a relationship is looked at as a defining relationship of the next decade or longer, uh, we also have drivers which are more strong than a single country's imperative. But yes, uh, we cannot ignore the realities of the geopolitical situation and that does play a role and we acknowledge that. So, you know, till now we've always uh, played the fact that we have a very neutral stand when it comes to Russia and the US. Their politics aside, we maintain our individual relationships. But in the recent past, we've seen Russia aligning itself closer to China. You know, uh, Russia has always been a very strong partner as far as India is concerned. Of course, a lot of people say that Russia gave us unprecedented access to their defense technology. I have a contrary view. I feel that it's all, it's everything is transactional. There's nothing which is free. Uh, but in this larger scheme of things where you have a geopolitics which is changing between Russia China and Pakistan, you know, Pakistan is also a factor. Uh, is it in is it in India's interest to continue to maintain the so-called strategic autonomy, or as some people, you know, on the social media and others, writers, thinkers, who say that it's time for India to take a stand and that stand should be closer to the U.S. What do you have to say? Sir? So let's be pretty clear that during the last 20, 25 years or more than that, the trajectory of our ties, the inclination is pretty clear. Uh, we started from zero uh, defense engagement with uh, the US at the big turn of this century. Today, um, 
uh, we are in the last five six years we've had uh, engagements to the tune of about 18 20 billion dollars uh, of us equipment um, now traditionally we went to russia because those avenues from the west were not available the us was not willing to provide us equipment um, uh, of a similar nature so in some ways the relationship with russia is a legacy issue because the trajectory is clearly moving towards a different direction the russians know it we know it um, where our interests coalesced uh, we had very good uh, ties where our interests are not coalescing for various reasons um, uh, we have a right to move towards um, uh, partners where our interests may now coalesce um, and it's pretty clear where we are moving having said that um, given the legacy which remains about 50 to 55 percent of our defense equipment still is of russian origin although we are not buying in the same quantity that we were buying before the these equipments take long time to change over so um i think we need to be understanding that our present needs do not allow us to jump ship midway uh india is a large country uh its needs have to be nuanced its engagements have to be nuanced um it can't be uh, that uh, we can do quick turn we are slow uh given our needs uh, we will have to be calibrated and ensure that nothing that we do uh, undermines our present uh, situation as you said there is a greater convergence of interest between china and the um, uh, uh, russia having said that let's also be clear that us is not decoupling from china all it is saying is that it is de-risking Uh, which means it wants a china plus one strategy it's not saying that no i cut off all my links i'm going to decouple so if that is the approach of the us then i think we are also um, well within our rights to say all right uh, i have a neighbor i have challenges with that neighbor i will balance it in different ways so i don't think um, uh, we need to uh, uh, take um, Uh, turns uh, which are of a 180 degree nature we are making that change it's a slow process we need time and space to get that process completed and during that process i don't think we should destabilize a relationship which has us in good stead in the past in some way uh, may not be to full satisfaction but uh, it has been helpful and in crisis has come in very handy So, you know, while we talk about this realignment that is taking place, you know, while we, uh, in as Indians, I, I mean, generally as Indians, we love uh, American burgers, American fries, Levi's clothes, music, everything about America, American college, universities. Uh, but however, in the in the Indian establishment per se, there is still a skepticism when it comes to the U.S. You know, whenever I speak to people, that I feel that there's a trust factor which is still lacking. you know that we can't really trust the us because us always looks out for its own every country looks out for its own but there is still a, a trust factor which is an issue is this something that you see also and do you think it is reducing or it can reduce in future sir so working together is a work in progress it's not an event it's only a process uh you only develop and engender trust with each other the more you work together because you understand each other better um over the last decade or so india and the us have worked together on many many issues i think the trust deficit is not what it was say at the say when i joined the foreign service because uh, at that time we had reason to be concerned um uh, the 1971 war was a uh, example the um, uh, association of pakistan with seattle and cento were other links um us was a prime supplier of arms to pakistan etc etc so there were very many reasons i don't think the lack of uh, uh, trust was without blame to be apportioned in every side um it 
it was a concern of ours we had seen some examples which were not satisfactory having said that i can tell you that we are seeing greater examples of cooperation i myself have seen how the us went out of its way to be supportive of us in designating terrorists at the un um, masood azhar let's not forget uh, was designated through a us initiative when we were not even members of the security council we worked in very close liaison but uh, uh, they were uh, leading the charge so there are many new examples of cooperation which didn't exist in the past so perhaps one way is to highlight those examples of cooperation now so that there will always be concerns uh, dissent is normal in diplomacy as it is in democracies uh, but important thing is that i think there is a clear shift and that shift is towards a better understanding of us imperatives and our needs and there is a matching of these uh, given that we have seen in the last 10 15 years that there are many things where we work together uh, and have been successful and it happens in some cases we will not be successful like you been mentioning some people have said about the um, buying of uh, um, oil from russia frankly i don't see this as a big issue at all uh, let me tell you why um the us and its uh, friends and partners and allies designed a system they said that you can anybody can buy oil at a certain rate there were no restrictions on that oil being bought except it's a transactional relationship we have entered into we benefited it from it our people benefited it's not that uh, the us wanted the oil to stop uh, because Uh, they would if there was such a situation the prices of oil would have gone up very dramatically so exactly. india is actually helping stabilize oil market so frankly um, i think uh, transactional opportunities will be there for us to gain uh, go beyond a partnership and benefit from uh, ways that may come up now so i would think that um, uh, we should look for opportunities Uh, where we our interests converge where our goals are similar and then have a mature relationship where differences may be there and those differences should be managed perfect uh, so one last question and i come back to uh, modi's ongoing visit now it's too early for me to ask you what do you think are the big takeaways uh, as far as the visit is concerned but in your sense where does this visit really lead us to in future you said you've you've seen the uh, relationship from the time that we joined foreign service if i'm not mistaken it was in 1985 to now 2023 where do you see this relationship going and with modi's visit and those big deals really taking place so um, one thing i learned while working with uh, prime minister modi is that he focuses on if i may say the diplomacy of deliverable uh he is uh, there will be a lot of pomp and show and uh, pageantry that's normal but uh, ultimately he looks for concrete deliverables i see this visit as leading to uh, deliverables in multiple directions you have listed some at the beginning uh, we don't need to list them right now but we will see it at the end so what it shows is that we have now found pathways uh, where they were some roadblocks uh, uh those have been moved out and then the sky is the limit uh, when two pluralistic um multi um, ethnic uh diverse de- democracies engage um uh, with so much of people to people contact commonalities in terms of cultural affinities etc um it just will be a win win situation Uh, both for the us and india if we can nurture this relationship into productive deliverables and i think prime minister uh, is generally known to focus on that and so i expect uh, only good things to come out of this visit it's only the amount of good things that will come out but i think we are in for better times perfect thank you so much sir for speaking to the print and for enlightening and for telling our audience on the importance of this particular visit and where this entire indo us relationship is actually headed to 
once again it's a pleasure to have you uh, on board with us sir thank you so much thank you very much nehesh thank you